to this. The key, of course, is family focus, mm -hmm. the perspective from the families. Um, kids, age groups, um, learning this for the first time. Adults, learning about this from the, for the first time. But also understanding the weight of what this all means and never forgotten. Mm -hmm. And so that's what we're really trying to take the, the larger piece. And of course, in your case, the loss of plants as well. Mm -hmm. And we now carry the family, the loved ones carry the burden to tell the story. So start by an intro, who you are, <coughs> and then go into our story. Do you want me to look at you or in You'll camera? Be at me. It's our okay. seven conversation. Okay, so you're not in this at all. I'm not in this at all. No voiceover. Or when anything. it's edited in, it's all it's okay. coming from the family. Okay, so you just want me to introduce myself. Yeah. Uh, I'm Janine Sijon. I am the sister of Captain Lance Sijon. Um, Lance and I were 12 years apart, um, which meant that he really stood in for me as a father figure. Um, so he was he has been my guiding light for a long time. Now, do you want me to continue or? Yes, and then... Ask me questions. Yes, I'll have questions. Um, of course, one of the main questions is, tell us a little about Lance's story. Okay. And I know that can be a huge... There's I'll so much to it. I'll try and distill it. Exactly. Um, <clears throat> Lance was an Air Force Academy graduate in 1965, and at that time, the Vietnam War was escalating, as we know, as we look back in history. They took those young men and they pipelined them quickly through um, uh, training and his was in the F4C Phantom Jet, that was the superpower of the, of the day. And then they got them right over to Vietnam. So Lance left in July of 1967 to go to Vietnam. Um, he was on his 52nd mission on November 9th, 1967. And it was a routine mission. He, he sent us a tape recording uh, before he went up. And he said, this is a routine mission. Um, we're just taking out a bridge. And um, <clears throat> it seemed simple. And of course, he um, kept a lot of the information from us. He didn't want us to worry. And uh, news was not as it is now. We didn't get immediate news. And so um, he sent that tape recording to us. And what actually happened to him that night is he went up um, in the F-4, they were um, about to take out a bridge at the Ben Boy Ford, and um, they released the ordnance, the bomb, and there was a faulty fuse in that bomb, which they were not aware of, and it exploded less than a second away from the aircraft, engulfing the aircraft in flames. Lance was able to eject, um, and he fell through the canopy jungle below in Laos. Uh, the guys knew that if they went down in Laos, rescue was going to be very unlikely. The terrain was, was so harsh. And so he, um, when he ejected, uh, the ejection ripped off his helmet and his first aid kit. He got hung up in the trees and he cut himself down and, and just crashed to the limestone karst below, which was in the jungle. Uh, he passed out, and when he regained consciousness, he assessed his injuries. Uh, he had broken hands. His, his hand, his right hand, was uh, broken so badly it was laying on the top of his arm. And the worst um, injury was a compound fracture to the left leg. Four inches below the knee, bone snapped off sharp, protruding through the skin. So he um, addressed his... Um, uh, He addressed his injuries by taking some of the cloth from his um, flight suit and wrapping his hands and wrapping his legs so that he could be mobile. At that point, he began a journey. Uh, it would be uh, 46 days in the jungle, crawling backward, no food, no water, uh, no medical attention. Imagine that the limestone karst is like uh, shredded glass. It, it just, um, it, it, it's so sharp that as he was dragging himself backward through the jungle with his elbows pulling himself, uh, his, his body was just being shredded. For 46 days, 
he continued to move forward. On Christmas Day, 1967, he passed out on a road. 210 pounds, six foot two Lance had been diminished to 60 pounds. 80% of his body was open wound. As he would lay unconscious, the um, rats would cover his body and devour the flesh. So he was um, unconscious on the road. The Viet Cong picked him up and took him to a temporary holding camp. They placed him on a table and placed one guard with him, feeling that he was no threat. Lance was so determined that he motioned down the guard, and as the guard came down to hear him, Lance placed uh, a karate chop at his neck and knocked the guy out. Lance rolled off the table, unable to brace his fall. All of that was very painful, and he continued again to crawl backward into the jungle. They took a village to try and find him, and it took them about a half a day. And when they did, they brought him back, and they put him in leg irons and, and heavy casts so that he could no longer move. They transported him to um, another uh, camp that was a prison. It was called the Bamboo Prison. It was in Vin. Uh, imagine just bamboo with a corridor in between all dirt floors. Each cell, six of them, three on each side, were about four by four feet. They had um, put Lance in one of those cells, and they brought in two more downed pilots, and they were across from him, Guy Gruders and Bob Craner. They could hear this interrogation and this torture across the corridor. Bob Craner was the commanding officer at that point, and he, he yelled over across to Lance, not knowing who Lance was. Just give them any information. You can't take these tortures. And Lance said, no, it's against the code. He would not divulge any information to put anyone in harm's way. Uh, they were then going to transport them to the Hanoi prison, which they called the Hanoi Hilton. They asked, uh, the guard asked the two airmen to take Lance out back to a stream to clean him up. They said, he stinks. Take him out and clean him up. As, Lan as, as Guy and Bob approached um, where Lance had been kept, they opened the door and Guy said he thought it was a child. It was just um, skeletal. All, all his knuckles, everything, was, um, was all the skin, all the flesh was gone. The back of his hips were both showing um, in, in full sight, in plain view, because he had gradually shredded himself. Lance said, Guy, is that you? And Guy Gruder said, yes, who are you? And he said, it's me, Lance Sijon. Guy and Lance had been in the same squadron at the Air Force Academy, the 21st Squadron. And, and Guy, to this day, said it broke his heart. The six foot two, 210 um, pound football player from the Air Force Academy was diminished to, to nothing, a shadow of a man. They took them and transported them to Hanoi in a flatbed truck. There were two 55-gallon drums in that flatbed truck full of gasoline that were untethered. So they were, they were bounced all around um, that truck. So one, one would hold back the drums while the other held Lance in their, in their lap. They stopped uh, at a village, and generally the trucks did not move during the day because they would be seen, so they would only move at night. So during the day, they would go to villages and they would cover the trucks up with um, branches and greens. <clears throat> As they took these three prisoners to this village, um, they pulled back the tarp on the truck. Now, normally the village would applaud. They hated Americans. We were destroying their country. And when they took back the, the tarp, the entire village, about 150 people, let out a sigh, a sigh of um, shock, looking at Lance. They quickly got rice for Lance to try and feed him. Lance couldn't swallow the food. He would go in and out of consciousness. They continued their journey. It took about 10 days to get up to Hanoi. 
And during that time when Lance would regain consciousness, he would ask Bob and, and Guy, how secure is this? Can we get a gun? Can we get out of here? Can we escape? He continued to talk about escape. When they arrived at, um, in Hanoi, it was early January, they put Lance in solitary confinement and they continued to torture and beat him to use him as an example as to what would happen to other prisoners if they decided not to give any information. But Lance wouldn't. He wouldn't give any information. So they continued to beat him. The prisoners were very valuable trading tools, bargaining tools. They didn't want them to die, but they wanted to have them become just short of death. The torture that the Vietnamese would use would be they would seat the POW on the ground and they would pull their shoulders back and tie their wrists and tie their elbows, then rotate those arms over their head to break them out of their shoulders. Then they would tie them, uh, their wrists to their ankles, and then they would pull them up uh, on a hook and beat and beat and beat them. To, Lance, to which Lance would say, I can't, it's against the code. My name is Captain, Lance. my name is Lance Saijan. He was lieutenant at the time. They put the three of them then, Bob Craner, Guy Gruders, and Lance in a cell so that they could care for Lance because they didn't want him to die. And the, the cell was a little bigger than the original one that Lance was in and they had three sawhorses with just two by fours over the sawhorses, that was the bed. And from that point, Lance continued to ask if they, could get, if they could escape. At one point, he asked the guys to pull him up so that he could sit up, so that he could do arm exercises. He said, help me. I'm, I'm, I'm good to go. I'll be good to go. Other points, they would find him um, scraping the concrete floor in a corner, trying to get out. He was not lucid. Lance lost consciousness. Um, uh, probably about uh, January 17, 18, and he was not speaking any longer. There was standing water in the cell, and so Lance began, began to contract pneumonia on top of all the injuries he already had. So the fluid was, was very audible, and they could tell he was in very bad shape. On January 21st, he sat up and in the loudest, strongest voice he had had since they had been with him. He called out and he said, this is it. It's over. Dad, where are you? I need you. With that, the other two prisoners pounded on the, the prison door, asking for the guards to come and help him. When they came, they took him away. The next day, uh, they came back and they said, Sai John died. He spent too long in the jungle. That was January 22nd, 1968. Let's stop there. Then yeah. we'll give yeah. me just a minute. That's the worst part. I won't be needing this again. I think one of the directions, information back to the family. How, how is the Air Force, the DOD, how are they communicating back? Right. Um, Again, not, it's chronicle, but I think it's important for people to understand. Oh, yeah, because if we're talking what about you were, What you were going through on this end yeah. and lack of information. <clears throat> the night of January 9th, 19th, uh, hang on, I yep. got water all over me. It was a Thursday night. It was January 9th, 1967. I was 13 years old. My mom and I were home, my dad was at work, and my other brother was at college. There was a knock on the door, and I peered outside the window, and there were two Air Force men there. Well, I was too young. I didn't have enough life experience or knowledge to know that was not good news, but that's how I received it. It's good news. Two Air Force men, something about Lance. My mom had come to the top of the stairs at that point, and I turned to her as she was up the stairs, and I said, Mom, there's two Air Force men here. And she just went down to her knees and held on to the railing at the top of the stairs. 
She said, don't open the door. I'm coming down. She came down, and, and the two Air Force men came in. And they read that um, your son, Lance Sarjohn, went down. They had just a little bit of um, what had happened, but not much. And they said no beepers were heard, no voice contact was made. This is all the information we have right now. My mom asked them to come and sit down. My dad was going to be coming home shortly, and she wanted them to read it to him. He came in the back door whistling, as he always did. I could hear his wingtip shoes across the kitchen floor. He came through the dining room and into the living room, and, and he just stopped. He knew. And my mom said, please read it. And they stood up, and they read it to my dad. My dad bristled like an animal. His head went back, and he howled. He ran through the rest of the house, throwing chairs and going down to the basement where his um, workroom was. And tools were flying throughout the basement. My mom gently escorted the two men out the door, and she had me sit down. I was uh, inconsolable. I didn't understand what it even meant. And I was screaming and crying, and my mom was holding me on her lap. She went down to take care of my dad. And um, I could just hear screaming, laughing, crying. He was hysterical. I walked over to the basement stairs, and I sat at the top of the stairs, and I saw my dad sitting on the bottom step with my mom holding him. Thirteen stairs separated us. The man that I had seen my entire life never break, never a crack. My mom, so incredibly strong. My mom turned to me and she said, Janine, go upstairs and get dressed. We've got to go tell your brother. So I went upstairs. It was, it was evening. And um, the, four, the three of us got into the car and my mom drove. My dad, these were bench seat cars. My dad was on the far passenger side. I was in the back. It felt like continents were between us. Nobody spoke. My dad was silent. We went to get my brother. And um, it was very late. And uh, all the lights in the house were off. And she rang the doorbell. They went and got my brother. He came out. And uh, he sat then in the driver's seat. And my mom then sat back with me. On November 11th, we got a phone call that they had made voice contact with Lance. Voice contact with Lance. He expressed the injuries that he had, and um, they were sending a rescue team to get him. They sent down the penetrator from the helicopter, which is like a cable with three prongs that will allow the PJ to go down, and it's shoo, it's that fast. It just goes right down, and he could jump off, grab Lance, put him on, and take him back up and rescue him. When they were talking to him as he was on the ground, he expressed that um, he was surrounded by the bad guys. And the PJ said, I'm coming down to get you. He said, negative. I'll crawl to you. They hovered for 33 minutes, and um, Lance couldn't make it. And they left. This is what they shared with the family. I couldn't understand how they could leave him. We later came to know it was the largest rescue attempt in the Vietnam War. 108 aircraft went in to get him. From that point on, that was the only information we had until 1973. The war was over. Lists were coming out of POWs killed in action, MIA statuses, because he was MIA that entire time. So in 73, the war was over. We still didn't know much about what had happened to him. Um, times have changed. Families are made aware of what's happening. Communication is maintained and support for the families to try and understand how to make their way 
once they knew this information. It wasn't like that then. My family was um, my generation. My father was a, a, the Depression era child, and there wasn't a lot of talking about um, their private lives. And I think my mom was also protecting my dad. It was too difficult for him. It was too difficult for my other brother. And um, I was still home. I uh, was in my teenage years. And uh, I, I think I probably cried for 10 years. But I also held out hope because my brother Lance surprised me all the time. If I was at a Girl Scout meeting, he would be around the corner and they'd say, Janine, go out and it's your turn to get a drink at the water fountain. And I would go out and he'd be holding it. Um, he'd surprise us by taking a bus home uh, um, from the Air Force Academy. And I might be in my, at one point I was in my bedroom on the second floor looking out the window, listening to music. And I saw him walking up, I saw him walking up the street with his big duffel bag. And I screamed, oh my God, Lance is home. When he got an, a new Corvette Stingray, 1965, bright red, cherry red, white convertible Stingray from um, in his final year, he surprised us by driving it home. He pulled into the front of the house and um, started beeping the horn and we were all home at that time and we all came flying through the front, um, front the, from the front door and Lance said, Janine gets the first ride. <laughs> so he put me in the passenger seat and took me for a ride. Those were all the things that he, he did, um, special, and, and so many more that I can't even go into. But I felt very seen and heard by him. My father, being a Depression-era child, worked all the time. I never saw my dad, and Lynn stepped in. What a blessing. And what a divinely scripted action, because I would end up being the gatekeeper. I would be the gatekeeper of Lance's story. So for years and years, we didn't know. The war was over in 1974. We got um, another call that they discovered that the Vietnamese actually honored Lance so much. They buried him, and they they, they carved a headstone with his initials on it. And they buried in a, him in a cemetery in Hanoi. And they were going to be going there and retrieving, recovering the remains of Lance. So in 1974, the remains of Lance came home in a box with the headstone. It was March 13th, 1974 my parents' 33rd wedding anniversary. There was no uh, military guard at that time. We went to the United Airlines Air Cargo to pick him up. We had a memorial service for him in April. And uh, we still didn't know many details because who was going to tell us? Who could share those details with us? In 1976, Lance was awarded the Medal of Honor. In March of 76, our family went out to the White House and President Gerald Ford presented posthumously the medal to my parents. When they read the citation, I had never heard these words connected to Lance. Emaciated, tortured. It was the first time I heard understood any of it. That same year, 1976, there was a dormitory at the Air Force Academy, and it was called the New Dorm. It wasn't there when Lance was there. And they decided to name it Cy John Hall. So in May of 76, we went out there to uh, help dedicate that dorm to Lance. They also made a beautiful life-size portrait of him, an oil portrait that was going to stand in Cy John Hall for the cadets to pass by every day. It looked exactly like him. When the artist was making the oil painting of him, we had sent out probably a hundred visual images um, for her 
to follow. She had a man of his stature um, pose for her. And she painted him as though he had just come off a flight in his flight suit. And it was um, powerful when they unveiled it to us. Today, that's outside of the auditorium, correct? When I saw it, when I went out there, I thought it was by an auditorium. There's two, yeah. There are two, okay. So, <clears throat> we don't need to say that, right? Yeah, in no, no, just, I'm just, yeah. just as a reflection point. You've got a little bit of... Tears. Which, yep. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Can you just ha hang on a sec? You're good. I can hang on as long as you want. Okay. Oh, it's boy. Yeah. It's going to get my... <laughs> You're doing perfect. It's perfect. How's um, the sound? Because it's underneath my shirt, and I know I hit myself. I'm you can sorry. Hear it, right? Yeah. Hold on one second. Do you want it outside? No, no. You're you're good. Your necklace just got a little. Thank you. Wonky. Thank you. Thank you, stylist. Okay. Are you just rolling? I am. Okay. <laughs> Also at that dedication was Guy Gruders. We had never met him before. Now, it's three years since he's been released. He's still processing so much. And Guy will tell you that his faith grew um, in the prison camp. He was angry for two years that they killed his friend and tortured his friend Lance Saija. And he prayed for two years. Help me forgive them. I'm filled with hate. Two years later, he found God in a way he had never felt before. And it empowered him and others. And he committed to telling Lance's story when he got home. He told us the story. And um, for him, it probably was a cleansing. For us, it was devastating. We um, came to understand things that we never knew. I think the knowledge of that was worse than not knowing where he was, if you can imagine. Because I thought that was the worst. But then to come to understand what had happened to Lance, it was more than we could ever imagine. My mom went over to Guy's wife, Sandy, and said, please have him stop. We were all pretty paralyzed. You'd think I could do this better. Um, for our family, once we came to know that information, I think there was another overturn of time for healing. Um, if we go back again to the years of uh, missing in action, my mom became an advocate um, for us to try and understand as a nation, as a community. Uh, the National League of Families was formed for those of us who had loved ones that were either POWs as identified or MIAs, begging uh, the Vietnamese to release the names of who was in the prison camp and who um, they knew were no longer with us if they died in the prison camp. Um, my mom would be on Wisconsin Avenue, and she would be handing out pamphlets about the desire for us to understand more of our loved ones and where they were. Remember now, there was great unrest in our nation. And there were protests for many young people that um, were opposed to the Vietnam War. So they were protesting, too. Um, they somehow found military uniforms. They would have an Air Force jacket on, and, um, but were protesting. And my mom would be handing out these pamphlets. And at one point, somebody came and knocked all the pamphlets out of her hand. She bent down, and she picked them all up, and she continued. She flew to Washington, DC to appeal to congressmen and senators to help us understand what was happening to our loved ones. I was falling apart. Um, the Sai Johns had the ability to show up in public 
in a way that we wanted Lions to be proud of us. But alone in the quiet corners of our home, in our now rooms, we were shattered. Because land surprised me so much, and because I was young and naive, I was certain he was coming home. I knew he'd come home and surprise me again. But then reality would, would set in, and um, I would just fall apart. When I became a mother, I reflected back on the strength of my parents, how they could do that how they could continue to represent Lance in a way with such dignity and grace and fortitude. So many um, honors uh, started happening regarding Lance after his um, Medal of Honor, and we attended all of them, as many as we could. They would often bring us in. And can you imagine we were with POWs at one point and they decided to dedicate uh, a moment to Lance. And they all held up candles. There were 150 people there. And we, such love, such love. I often say, Lance's story is a love story that happens to take place in a time of war. It was about love. The Medal of Honor, was uniquely given to Lance, unlike others. There was no action, there was no commanding officer, there were no troops, there were, it was just him alone. I talk about the chatter of the mind that everyone, everyone gets. Every day we get chatter of the mind. Sometimes it says, you're not worth it, you can't do it, give up. You can imagine that for him. And when he saw that helicopter leave, I was so confused, how could they leave him? Well, they had to. In later years, I understood that two helicopters went down, they rescued them. The, the Vietnamese were coming in with um, surface-to-air missiles, and they were in trouble, and night was coming, and they had to leave. But they said they would come back the next day, which they did. They couldn't find Lance, because Lance fell into a sinkhole as the uh, enemy came closer. He fell onto his radio and drained the battery. So they couldn't find him again. Dang. I'd like to... Can I talk about the story of love? Yes. It's important. Yes. And I want this in. I'll try and go as quickly as I can. I'm going to start it again as one segment. One, one minute. I often talk about this being Lance's legacy as a, a love story that happened to take place in a time of war. The first act of love was not letting the PJ come down. He wouldn't put him in harm's way. The next act of love was when he was with Guy and Bob when they were in cells on either side of him when he was in isolation. The Vietnamese had them come and feed Lance because he was dying and they needed to keep him alive. Lance decided to give each one of them a cover story. He told Bob in the morning what the story was, Guy in the afternoon what the story was, so that when they were being interrogated, they would have a similar story. That's the next act of love. In Lance's dying moments, he did not call out in hatred. He called out in love for his father. These are acts of love, all acts of love. Go ahead. I'm trying to take it to, go ahead. To remove your mic Battery? Again. No, no, no. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank no, you, thank, okay. you. Okay. thank you, thank you, thank you. Strength of memory, the importance of remembering, and healing. 
I think those are three elements. You have the ability because you've lived it mm -hmm. and you continue to live it. How do we convey that to those who may be observing, listening to your story? And I think this is an important life lesson. This is an extreme situation, but there's so many other points in other people's lives. How can we connect this? How can we hit a light switch? And again- Let me do my best. Yep, no. And so the importance of remembering always remembering resilience, strength through loss, th strength from loss, and takeaway. So something in that mm -hmm. kind of general area. <clears throat> I am the gatekeeper of Lance's legacy, Lance's full life. It became clear to me that people needed to know more about Lance. So often I speak about Lance globally. And this, one of the same sentiments that came up over and over through decades was when I, someone would come up to me and say, when I came to know Lance's story, I thought to myself, if he could do that, I can do this. I often ask when I'm in a group, what is your this? What is your this? I will continue as a um, life path to share Lance's story because I think that that story has so many elements that can connect to individuals that come to know that story. I often say that when I decided to make a film about Lance, um, I wanted people to know what they had in common with him rather than what separated them. I often say that I believe that each of us have a coliseum of people that we know and may not know that are in another place, their home, and they watch over us. They guide us. They mentor us. They protect us. If we stay open to that, we'll hear them. Lance is in that Coliseum for me. Lance could be in that Coliseum for you. If you decide that this story is powerful for you and the elements that you have in common with him connect you. We are all human beings learning as many lessons as we can as we walk each other home. We're trying to go home in the best way we know. We all have that in common. Let's walk each other home together. When we remember those, those stories, those contributions to humanity that make us understand, we have just often touched the edges of what we are capable of. These legacies, these stories, help us understand that our expansion is unlimited, unlimited. Lance's resiliency, his honoring the code, never putting others in harm's way. Leadership. Leadership has to come from within you first. You can become a leader within yourself. Oftentimes, language is so limiting. I believe that it's the energetic output. We have met people in our lives, throughout our lives, that you just feel them. When they walk in a room, you feel them. When you talk to them, they're intentional. They're looking you in the eyes. They see you, they hear you. That's leadership. You want to follow that individual. There are stories over and over of those who serve. And whether it's military or in the private sector, they're serving. It's so important. 
we have to be able to see the bigger picture outside of ourselves. More joy is out there when you are supporting it. You have to know yourself. You have to work hard at knowing yourself. When I did research, remember I was a young girl with Lance, and so when I started making the film, I had an opportunity to know Lance in a very different way because I only knew him as an adoring brother. And what came up over and over in separate interviews was there, that he knew himself so well. And what is the power of knowing yourself? You don't define yourself by others. You know who you are. And to parents, I say, with your children, who were all hoping find the right group, they will if they know themselves because they don't have to get the applause from those that aren't um, uh, carrying truth and love in their hearts. They don't care because they know themselves. And Lance knew himself very, very well. He did a lot of things. Um, he, w he had such a contrast unto himself. He was an all-city football player. Um, he was uh, uh, the lead in the class play. He was the president of his class, the president of the SGA, Student Government Association. Um, what a contrast that young man was unto himself. And so in some circles, part of the choices he made would not have been acceptable. But what's the magic? He knew himself. It was OK. He didn't need their, their opinion. As we build this exhibit, and has its impact on our community, we're close to it. Not as close to it as you are, from the story perspective, from the life perspective. What's the importance of this exhibit to this community on this topic? Um, let me ask you something. Is yes. this going to be played on a kiosk at the exhibit? The exhibit's already there. Yeah. So and I just had to clear And then that. a microsite as well. So they'll be able to access the content. Yeah. I'm just saying it's all online. done now. Yes. I'm just getting yes. my timetable. Yes. As you engage in this POW MIA exhibit, it might be. As you engage in this POW MIA exhibit, it will be very helpful for you to be very intentional. Why are you here? If you're here and you made that decision to be here and you're with a group or by yourself, make it valuable, be intentional, absorb it. If you need to take a deep breath in to settle yourself, I want you to go and experience this. This isn't textbook. This is experiential learning. I also believe that all those we are representing energetically are here with us. They're at this exhibit. They will guide you. They will love you. They will care for you and protect you. So learn about them. Know who they are and go from individual to individual, whatever, whatever information you can receive, go home and do more and find out who they are. If that resonates with you, if one item resonates with you, take it, expand it, feel it. Grow with it. That's perfect. That was fantastic. I, can I ask you one thing? You don't have to talk about it if you don't want to. Um, you said that a guy, when he came back, he, he, he kind of he, he prayed a lot when he was there. And he said, he, he, did he forgive the, the uh, it, do you? You found forgiveness? Let me, can I say this too? Mm. Many people ask me if I hate the North Vietnamese from that era, 
do I hate what they did to him? I, I think that was one of the most painful things, particularly when I became an adult, to imagine one human being being able to do that to another human being. I also realized that the carnage of war is not one-sided. It has two sides. I don't know what the North Vietnamese were thinking when they created these acts in those prison camps. But I will tell you this, hatred is um, very debilitating. It will stop you in your tracks. It will stop the growth. It will stop the love, because it's opposite of love. Hatred is like swallowing poison, expecting you to choke. They're not going to choke. You will. Have I forgiven? Yes, I have. I won't keep that hatred in my heart. I don't understand what they did. I can imagine as we're engaged in war and the horror that we created in their land as well, that is war. So here's the underlying question under that. Do we still want to resolve conflict in this way? Can we find other ways? Will the children help us? Will the children become more aware because our, our social context is so much bigger with all of the, the ability we have to learn about other cultures and other people and differences? Will they help us? I hope so. I want to say one last thing for closing. It might be good. Yeah. Um, Real quick, did you ever go back? No, I don't want to. Because it won't be the, anything like no, it was. Right. Okay. And I would feel like there's nothing here. Yeah, so everybody asks me that. Um, okay. Often my closing statement when I'm speaking to groups is that I quote Mark Twain. Mark Twain said, the two most important days in your life are the day you were born and the day you find out why. Why are you here? What will you become? There may be an opportunity for you at this exhibit to determine, I want to be like him. These are, these are men that had families and neighborhoods and schools and life experiences just like you. Who will you become? Thank you. Mm -hmm. And I apologize for crying. No, I, 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 I this happens a lot and, and well, it, I need to be strong for you. No, no, it makes me know, no, I'll tell you, it makes me know I'm touching hearts. So I can have, I, the, probably the biggest group I've had is 2,500 and, um, and 10, yeah. you know, yeah. doesn't matter, right? To me, it doesn't matter, it's all the same. But I hear this the whole time. Yeah. I hear it the whole time. That makes me know I've touched them, that Lance is, is in there now. Mm -hmm. And that's what I want. I want him in there. <laughs>